Welcome to After Painting. So what does one do when one has finished painting the great majority of their never-ending horde of unpainted lead board gaming miniatures? I don't know. So that's what we're going to find out in this show. Uh, so stay with me. Uh, leave your comments, suggestions, and concerns. And let's go and see what life is like after painting. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of After Painting. So we are finally back and settled uh, in Texas. And this will be the first After Painting here and it will be the last one of the year. So it's kind of my uh, After Painting holiday special, but there's really not anything Christmassy or holiday about it. It's just what I do on a normal basis. So we got some interesting things for you in this uh, in this episode. Kind of a mix of a lot of different things that I think most of you guys will enjoy. So if you're new to our after painting, basically it is kind of like a uh, variety show. You know, we kind of move from different things and we track the progress usually of of one project or one thing from beginning to the end. And that kind of brings me to uh, the first thing we're going to look at today and after painting. Take care. Alright, so welcome back everybody. So, what you are looking at here is actually a thrift store pickup of a ship. And I never, I've never quite been able to figure out what this ship goes to, but I always thought it would make a pretty cool elf ship. Uh, just redo the paint job. Now, if you look on the bottom, I paid three sixty-three, but there's no, uh, there's kind of no toy manufacturer name to let me know what series it went to. It reminds me of something on a series called the Pirates of Dark Water. That used to be a, a TV show that I actually pretty liked, uh, pretty well liked. It is a large ship. I mean, if I was to grab a random miniature for scale, you know, you can see the uh, the wheel uh, there is probably the size of her entire body, but. You know, when you are playing a lot of pirate actions and you want to put 20 or 30 figures on a ship, I think it would actually work. But, I'm not sure if we're going to be doing that this episode because we have something else I might do instead. And that is this. This is a thrift store castle that I picked up. That I have no idea what it goes to. I believe it probably went to some Disney playset. Now you can see I've actually started repainting it. But I've never quite gotten back to it. I probably started this over a year ago. And I'm thinking now may be the time to see if we can bring this castle to life. It does open. But I will show you guys what it looks like on the inside. If we decide to do that. But. Maybe I'll do the ship. So you guys will not know. Unless you watch the rest of the episode. You know. And find out. Which one of these. We are going to. Turn into a completed hobby project. In this episode. Of After Painting. Okay, so while we wait to see uh, which one of those projects is going to get green lighted on this episode, kind of leaning toward the ship, but I like the castle as well. What we are going to do is some unboxings. Uh, I have finally gotten around to picking up some more of the latest Wiz Kids, as you can see here. So I thought this episode would be a good opportunity to unbox some of them and take a good look at them. So we will pick one of these to start with 
and uh, now let's see what we got. Maybe we can add one of them uh, to one of the projects we're doing. Um, you know, we can put a uh, a billboard or a bulletin board inside the castle. That would be pretty cool. As you enter the castle, you check for notices, or I don't know. Maybe we can use this guy, turn him into a masthead for the ship. Who knows? Either way, let's take a look at these in a little more detail. Then after we do that, we will uh, check back up on we will check back up on the castle or the ship to see which one is going. Or maybe we will be doing something else. So you got to stay tuned and see. All right. Okay. So the first thing we are going to be unboxing, as you probably could figure out, is the bulletin board. Now, if you get a look at this, basically five bucks, you get the one bulletin board. Uh, I mean, these things are probably dirt easy to paint up and uh, use. The secret is getting some images to put on the board, which I think I've seen people like do stuff off the internet. Uh, I have a couple ideals. I'm not exactly sure if they would work. But I may implement them. I will say this is actually a little bit harder. At least it feels that way than the usual uh, WizKids plastic. It is not bendy at all. I mean, this is a very sturdy bulletin board. So you obviously have your bulletins and your board. So not much to that. Let's grab something else. No sense in stopping there. And this is a, let's see here, this is a whale. You never have too many whales. I'm sure I've got some whales in resin from some other kits that I bought, but I, like I said, you can never have too many whales. Let me get my hands off the camera. I know that, that probably scares you guys. But here is the whale, and that is focusing. You do have a translucent inside in there. You have a bucket and a rope. If we sit that there and we put a figure here for scale, you can see she can hide behind this well as she prepares her next shot. All right, or maybe she is going to look down that well and see what's about to come up out of there. <laughs> so you have a bulletin board and then you have the well, right? Maybe there's a notice on the bulletin board saying, you know, anyone that can creature, kill the creature in the well, you know, report to the castle for payment. But this is actually pretty solid too. I mean, this is, this is sturdy. This whole bottom piece is, you know, very solid. So, you know, you can do some water effects on there. It should be pretty easy. So definitely looking forward to painting these up. And we will take a look at some other items that we have to unbox uh, when we get back. Hey everybody. So in this little segment, I am going to paint this figure of Rob Stark. I hope you guys can see that the lighting is a little bad, but every now and then I get people that say, oh, I wish you would do a painting video or, you know, could you show us how you paint? So I think this is kind of a good miniature to start with. If you look at the uh, sample picture, there's one, two, three, maybe four colors. You have the brown uh, fur, the silver armor. The kind of bluish gray uh, undercoat or gambeson, and then the blue uh, cape and uh, surcoat. Now I'm not going to follow that exactly because uh, I don't technically like it exactly. You can already see I've I've already primed the miniature in uh, gray, and I've already done his uh, his fur white because I was working with another figure, and I didn't want to waste the paint. But I am going to follow probably 90% of it. So 
Let's take a look at how I do this. I think I can get him probably 75% finished uh, while we sit here. And I will try to explain to you guys my thinking and my theory uh, as I go, you know, with how I paint my miniatures and exactly how I paint them very quickly, uh, usually. So we are back with some more unboxings and this time we are going to be taking a look at the tent and the lean-to. We can show you that. They're pretty basic, but uh, everyone loves a new, a good tent. So let's get this open. Now I have seen unboxings of some of these. Although a lot of the people do not take them out. They just show you it in the package. And then some of them that do take it out don't really have good cameras. But that's not their fault. So this is just a basic lean-to. Which is actually nice though because you could literally make one of these on your own to match it. You take some uh, toothpicks. Uh, then you put some type of uh, covering over them to be the, uh, the fur. So there's some different things you could do, like paper towel, toilet paper, whatever, with glue. Yeah, and then you take two more cross sticks, maybe some thread, and you could make several of those. And then here's the tent, which has a lot of character with the stitches and the tattering, the little pole in the center. I like that. You usually, That's usually left out. So and you could put them, put them like this, maybe. Right, I like that. Maybe he cooks under here and he sleeps in there. Or maybe it's a she. So to show you the scale, as she stands outside her tent. But yeah, you get both of these for you know five bucks. This is pretty pretty thick. I mean, it's not real. It's not bendy. This is not like the Reaper. Reaper bones are uh, plastic. I mean, it's not that bendy, squishy plastic. So what do we have next here? Next we have a fountain. But obviously that is uh, Poseidon or Neptune, I guess, or their D&D ver version, which is a fountain. Let's, let's get this open. And let's see what we... Uh, what this looks like. This is always nice for a town or city square. You know, again, something you could sit in the can. Okay, so the first thing I noticed is it's multi-part. So you have this base here, which looks odd without the fountain portion in it. So you put that in there. I mean, I'm assuming you would you would glue this if you want this to stick. And there is a slot, I guess. Okay, and then you get the actual fountain. Now, I guess this is actually nice for painting because you could paint them separately. This one appears to be one piece. A little bent there, but that, that actually might not be bad for some character. You know, you could do a, a chipping or dent effect there to look like it got bent maybe during a battle. The spear is a little bendy. But not worth trying to fix. You put this in here. I'm assuming it, yeah, there's a slot. And there it is. It has the water on the top and the bottom. And again, we put our female here for scale, our massive darkness figure. And you know, you can see her hiding behind there or somewhere near around there. Or standing up here. Well, that definitely is cover, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually complete cover. This does need to be glued, though, because this is very loose. So I would use crazy glue on there after you're done painting it. 
But yeah, that's not too bad. We've got this, uh, we've got the fountain, the tent, and the lean-to. Okay, okay. This is turning out to be a good episode. All right, let's just get back to the rest of the show. See you in a minute. Hey, welcome back, everybody. So right now, I'm going to kind of go over my reading list with you in case you guys are looking for some stuff to read. It's always nice to uh, intersperse some good fiction with your hobby just to kind of give you some ideals. Now, this is a series, I think it's called The Viking Dead, but it's called The uh, Tomes of the Dead. It's a, by, a guy by the name of Toby Venables. Now, I have not started on this, but I am familiar with uh, kind of the series in the sense that the, the publisher, and who publishes this? Abbott and Books, I believe. Uh, what they do is they take medieval era, dark age era, and they kind of mix it with uh, gothic horror. So what we have here, it says it's Northern Europe, 976 AD, be off in the Viking crew of the ship. Hafna flee up an unknown river after a bitter battle only to find themselves in a bleak land of pestilence. The dead don't die but become Draugr, the undead, returning to feed on the flesh of their kin. Terrible stories are told of a dark castle in a forbidden fjord and of black ships that come raiding with invincible Draugr berserkers. And no sooner has Beof resolved to leave than the black ships appear. Now stranded, his men cursed by the contagion of walking death, Beof has one choice. Fight his way through a forest teeming with zombies, invade the castle, and find the secret of the horrific condition, or submit to an eternity of shambling, soulless, undeath. So, and you can see here that uh, there's other books in the series. I'd like the art. I'm not sure who did the illustration. Berserker. Undead Berserkers. So how would those be for miniatures, right? That'd be friggin', friggin' cool. This is not an easy book to find. Uh, I think I had to order this online. I looked at uh, Half Price Books, Barnes & Nobles. They, they, it's not carried on the shelf. Uh, what is the... Uh, let me see what the publication date is. In case that will help any of you. Uh, So if you look here, 2011, so it's about eight or nine years old, uh, but check it out. I have read books kind of in this uh, genre. Uh, the one I read is actually set in the Arthurian era, and it's about, it's basically about a knight who has uh, the ability to go berserk. Uh, and, you know, he kind of uses it in the story. He has to go into this forest and find out what's going on with this town that has been attacked by these basically demonic wolves of some sort. So and he tracks them down because they have taken some children. But it's actually, these, I actually do like the series and the genre. Uh, I have not read Tony Venable yet. Uh, I think the one I read was by Paul. Was it Paul Finch? Uh, Stronghold. So that's that's another book. But again, you see where it says the tombs of the dead. Now, another book we're going to take a look at, totally off beat, is Knights of the Round Table. This is a classic. L.A. Bortolusi. I'd love to get Arthurian tales. I'd love to... Uh, Read the different takes on the sword and the stone, or in this case, the sword and the anvil. And I love the illustrations more than anything. You know, if you want to get sent back into a period of time, these classic children's illustrations. I mean, look at the colors on these plates. If you're thinking of uh, coloring up knights and you're tired of the drabs, you know, the browns, you know, and the tans. Let me see if they say who is. I'm trying to see who it's illustrated by. Uh, 
don't know. It says that it's translated by Lee and Bortolucci. Let's see the copyright date. Illustration by Piero Cantanillo, 1991. So, I'll take you through. I mean, most of you are probably familiar with the story of King Arthur. So you have him pulling the sword from the stone. You have Merlin watching over it. A young King Arthur riding out on his charger. Uh... There, and there are so many stale, tales of the round table that is very interesting because you can always run into a new tale or a different version of an old tale when you collect these. So here, this is basically Arthur taking on some Vikings, right? So if you watch the series Vikings, you know how much trouble they were to the people of that era. And so you have Arthur, who basically is going to rid the land of the Viking incursions. Although some of them wind up becoming kings in his court, right? Because Arthur was actually considered a king of kings, meaning he had kings who pledged their fealty to him. Uh, that was what his father, Uther's name, Uther Pendragon, meant. You know, Pendragon meant, you know king of kings or king lord of other kings so now this looks like a dwarf so in this tale you have some type of dwarf that plays into it a maid in distress you know what it's funny because if you think about most of our miniature games and stories and settings how many of them have maids in distress although in i would say the great, ma great majority of Arthurian tales, that was the inciting incident, as they say. That there was a maid in distress of some sort. Look at that white, man. I really like these knights who are arrayed in white on white horses. You know, how many of you have a miniature army that looks that good? I would love to do one of those. And you could use some miniatures from Fireforge Games. Maybe even some late uh, Middle Age Perry Medievals and really do that. Or of course, unless you have the old Games Workshop uh, Knights Aaron or Bretonian Knights, which were so good. Especially the last iteration for 6th edition. So again, we have a knight approaching a castle. Is that the Black Knight? He's in combat. Whoa, now here is a female in armor, right? So all of you that, that want to see strong female characters, there you go. The Arthurian tales were featuring them beforehand in armor. And I mean, she's not scantily clad, so you could actually do a miniature of her. Look at the castle, man, and the entrance. Look at the lighting. The Dolorous Guard. Look at this guy's castle. That looks like a crypt of some sort. So I'd have to, I'd like to read that. This says the kidnapping of Gawain. Like, I don't even remember Gawain being kidnapped. I remember him being captured on several occasions and having to submit to errands. Which is another thing you can play out that you never really hear about. Is say you do a scenario and your characters lose and are captured. Right? Instead of being killed, perhaps they're captured. And in order to be freed, they have to complete some quests for the person that captured them. And so this is a way of actually putting in some not-so-honorable missions for your characters. But, you know, they're doing it out of their... Either the pledge that they have given, that they cannot take back. Or to maybe release, to have one of their fellow companions released, right? Who is being held until they complete the quest. The poison apple. All right, and that pretty much gets us toward the end. Now, I do not think this one ends with Mordred. 
All right, so this is just various tails. Morgan Le Fay schemes. Look at that cart. I like that. The war between brothers. So now, I don't know. In some tales, Mordred is Arthur's son. So I'm not exactly sure if that's what they're referring to with the war between brothers, is whether or not they're saying Mordred is his brother. Okay. The attack of the joyous guard. The return of Guinevere. Whoa, look at those ships and the sails. I mean, some of them sails you could actually recreate on your own ships. The duel. Okay. I don't know, is that Sir Gawain against Sir Launcelot? Oh, Mordred the traitor. That looks like the death of Sir Gawain. It was a great night. The Battle of Salisbury. Oh, look at that. Let's get some better lighting. The death of King Arthur. So it does, this one does end with his death. Is that Excalibur lying there broken? That looks like Sir Launcelot. The end of Launcelot. Oh. So I definitely want to read this, and that's the last picture. Let's read that. Whatever God shall wish, said Sir Lancelot. He tearfully hugged his companion goodbye and then turned and went along his way. Yeah. Sometime later, his soul finally went to join God. Yeah, they don't put that in books anymore. Unfortunately. You can't understand Arthur and the Arthurian legends and the power that they resonate unless you understand the whole story of Christ, the whole story of the Grail, the whole story of, you know, virtue, chivalry, loyalty, honor. But yeah, if you get a chance, pick that up, guys. Take care. God bless, and uh, see you in a few minutes, I guess. Okay, so everybody, if you can see here, I've got uh, all of my colors that I think I'm going to use laid out. I've got this blue. This is actually called a Mordian blue. Uh old citadel color i really like this color i don't know what it's called now but i've got some uh gold which you didn't see in there this is brass but i use it as gold some black some brown some gray and then some uh shadow steel by reaper i tend not to use silver you know, unless i'm doing paladins or something i've also got my miniature right here who i will i will try to move into view uh, and you can see I've mounted him on a, uh, I've mounted him on a, uh, a little stand so I can hold him. So, uh, right off the bat, I am going to start putting this blue here on his, uh, I believe this is a surcoat. Uh, and I'm using a pretty big brush, right? Now, one thing I do that maybe some people don't do is I will paint a color, one color, even though it's not going to stay that color. So, like, you can see I'm going over belts and things that I will probably go back later and uh, correct those colors. But because it's, part, it's easier to just do the whole area in this color, I just do it and then I worry about it later. So, we get that on there. 
I'm going to drop that brush real quick. I'm going to pick up this one. And now I'm going to do his uh, cape in a black. If I can get this brush wet. So now I am simply getting as much of this cape as I can get. And again, you know, if I get some paint on the other colors, oh well, we'll go back over it. I mean, that's just, to me, that's just how you speed paint, right? I'm not trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, do my first, my first pass at, at a Picasso or something. This is just getting paint on the model. So hopefully you can see this. I can't see the camera while I'm doing this, but, uh, I'd rather, I thought the black would actually be a better, uh, cape or cloak or whatever because uh, it's more consistent with the movie even though I know this these figures are based on the book that doesn't mean much to me so I got the black on there I'm going to do his boots in black while I'm down here because part of the boots are showing so we'll get those now you did notice that his flesh was already done and this model doesn't have a lot of exposed flesh I mean basically his face and if you want a hand I've seen people do this hand gloved which it doesn't appear to be gloved to me so we have that done next we're going to do his hair and I usually will use the same brush I mean I don't tend to switch brushes very much at all uh, if you get a good brush I love this is called the Reaper uh, you know, I forgot what it's called, like the Reaper Army Brush or something. But I, I love this brush because I can do small things with it. Or I can do rather larger things with it or medium things with it. You know, just by kind of contouring the brush edges, I can get in just about any area I want. So you can see there his brown hair is done. I got a part right here by his neck. That I didn't get with this uh, with the blue so we will go in there and put that in there so we want to make sure we get that now we're gonna have to let that dry to a certain extent before we can go over the stuff like the belt and the pouches that are that are under there but you see that is done so next I am going to do his armor which is basically this arm here. So we apply this paint. And I'm I'm what you call a pusher, I guess. Meaning I tend to put paint on the model and then push it to where I want it. Uh, some painters actually uh, will only apply the paint very thinly to a certain area. And, you know, then they'll go pick the brush up and go to the next area. I will tend to put it in a spot and then push it across the model to other areas. Now, this model actually has kind of a bad gap where its wrist meets its arm, which, you know, I probably could have took some time and tried to fix it, but it really wasn't all that important to me. So now I'm doing his leg in the armor. Which I think in the picture, they might have had his leg as uh, gray. Which I don't know if they meant that to be armor or if they were trying to show that he had breeches on under there. But I'm doing his legs as if he's fully armored. So we're going to get in there. Now there's a few areas I can't really get to because of the black, the black paint is not dry. All right, so now that we've done that, I'm going to hit this chain mail with the gold. Which really, I really like like using gold in that. I mean, I don't I don't think nobody ever had gold chain mail, but I, I could be wrong. So, I will also hit his uh, sword hilt right here. With that gold or... The actual color is brass, but I like it better than regular gold, so I call it gold. 
So we have the hilt. Can't really see the pommel or the sword, so uh, no sense in painting that. Also called the handle. So I am going to do the actual blade now with this same uh, this same shadow steel, which is a nice color. And again, the blade you can't even get to all of the blade, unfortunately. Is that? bothers me because I'm afraid it's going to show up later but you, know, you get to what you can you can see I'm turning the miniature an awful lot trying to get under there uh, but from what I can see I, I can't get to all of it so there is one little thing I could do is maybe hold this up get that under there just to get some space but it's not it's not gonna stay up so probably can't see it if I can see it later I will go back uh, now at this point I mean there's not a lot else you can do while you wait you know he's on some kind of rock or stone so maybe I will paint that you know I will find a color to do that let's just try a bone white right here or skeleton bone to do this rock or stone mix a little brown in there I'm just mixing that up on my palette just to give this a rocky color now pretty much until until the rest of this 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 stuff dries I really can't go back in there and like touch up the other details I'm just gonna get a bunch of smearing so pretty much at this point you know we're just gonna probably have to put the figure down and wait for what we've done to actually dry so we've got this base kinda pretty much done but like I told you, this guy is, I mean, he's basically 75% finished. You know, I, I'm, I can do some accents and some, uh, you know, I, I can do, some, I'm going to have to do some touch-ups, but like his little pouch here, you know, I can do that now in brown. Uh, I'm going to put some gold up there. Let's see if I can get that in without a smear. Definitely got to touch up his uh, surcoat. So we've got some gold in there. So and that comes around just, probably just a wee bit through there. Maybe a little more. I'll put a little gold trim there. And some, uh, now this is another reason, like I told you, I like this brush because now I want to get right up in here and I hope you guys can see this. And all I got to do is use the very tip of this brush so I don't have to change my brush at all. Same thing with this side, just very, very, very tip of the brush. Right, and it's just basically a matter of learning how to control control your brush. So some of that's going to need to be cleaned up. All of it will pop, as they say, uh, when we put a wash over this. You know, you can do a black wash or what they call Agrax Earthshade, which is a, a brownish wash. Uh, I will probably do a black wash. I just usually like when guys are more stoic. And I'm getting right up in here around this collar. I just wanted to put a little gold up there on the collar. So he's actually looking pretty good. I'm going to need to clean that up maybe with some white, some of the where the brown hair came down. The cloak you can see here has gotten a lot on it. But black you can... You can put black over almost anything, so 
You know, if your black gets messed up, you can almost fix that without even waiting for the other color to dry. Some of the other colors you got to wait for them to dry. But more or less, if you guys can see this, let's see here. Yeah, that is a, fi a finished miniature. And I don't know, what did that take? Five or six minutes? Okay, everybody. Take care. Uh, hope you enjoy the next segment. So we are back. And if you were voting for the castle, then you got your wish. Because this is kind of what I am going for. Uh, the look, I think this is called a medieval Amsterdam castle. So if you can see, it kind of has that blue roofing. And then the uh, kind of the whitewashed stone. This one kind of has a tint of uh, kind of like an earthy color to it. But... Uh, now mine has a few more details in it, so I will have to, I will have to add lib those details. But for the most part, you know, this is what we're going for. We're going to try to get that look. So, uh, let's see if we can get the castle over here and take a look at what we're going to need, uh, what we're going to need to do. All right, so I have the castle on my workbench. And for purposes of this, it doesn't really matter what's on the inside. We'll we'll deal with that later. Uh, I'm not sure if you can tell, but the roofs are actually already tiled in the blue. Because I think that was the color I spray painted the whole model. It was a grayish blue from Army Painter. So I may, I may have to go back over to that those they've dulled out over the years. Uh, the walls are pretty much already white. Again, I will have to go over those. Uh, all of this is going to need to be painted. So this will all get whitewashed. Or I could go with a uh, earth color, like a cl clay stone color, to kind of uh, signify that it is a uh, a citadel that they would that the uh, king or the lord of the castle could retreat to if the castle is breached or i could leave it the same color i will probably leave it white just to be a little consistent uh the gate entryway obviously we will probably do that with stone we will probably need some uh some wood here this portion i'm probably going to do all in a a stone type of color You've got things like this, which we will probably try to pick out later with some gold or some kind of trim. Although I don't really know if the gold would be appropriate. But it, this this castle does have a lot of these, uh, you know, spires. So I don't know if you if you if you try to think about them too much, you could really make the make the whole castle too busy, which I don't want to do. And then. Uh, Finally, in this area here, I kind of tried to clean this out because it's gotten spider webs and things. This will probably be a brown earthy color, like mud. Uh, I will hit that with some brown muddy color and then maybe dry brush it a little bit lighter. Because that's all they would have had would be mud floors. So the question now is which what, what are we going to tackle first? Uh... I'm imagining I should probably do the white in here first. That way, in case some gets down on the ground, I can cover it all up uh, with the, the muddy color. So do that last. Or I could do this area down here, just something easy to get the stonework out of the way. So that is what we are aiming for. And when we get back, you will see uh, how well we did or how far we've gotten take care
So, I have a little confession to make. You guys may recall uh, last month I was doing a whole series of unboxings. And I think it started in October, actually early September, went through October. It was 48 days of unboxings. But I kind of held out a miniature on you guys. And I don't know why I did it. I mean, it just just overcame me. And I got filled with uh, maybe some envy and some jealousy and a little bit of pride. And so I decided not to unbox this miniature. But now I've had a chance to uh, reconsider my ways. I've had second thoughts. You guys are so good, so kind to me, so nice, that I decided I am going to unbox this miniature. This is a knight. I got this knight uh, on Etsy. I believe I've actually showed you guys the site if you go back and look at one of my videos. Uh, don't remember which one it was or else I put a card on at the end. But I think it was one of them during the unboxings. Uh, probably when I unboxed the Brother Vinny stuff. So take a look there. I think I mentioned Etsy. But I think the guy that does these is named Dennis Samarin. He is in Russia. It takes about... Mm, four weeks for these to come but usually you will get notices that hey the orders received your order has been processed your order has shipped your order has arrived so you know the, the four weeks goes kind of quickly that way it's not like you don't hear anything for four weeks and you're wondering if you know you paid money to a dead uh, site but this is how it comes I mean other than the custom packaging which I threw out so he has his own uh, seal, which I think is lovely. It says Fantasy Minis, which you can see there. And now we are going to open it up and take a look inside. I don't recall looking at this, so I think I am going to be as surprised as you guys are. I, I do recall getting it, you know, obviously. So you get this packing material. We'll take that out. And underneath there is this miniature. Now, the miniature is multi-part. A lot of multi-parts. Looks like you have a... Wow, look at that. Another seal. So, I will tell you, the miniature cost about $18 on Etsy. And then by the time you add the shipping, which I think was like $8 American dollars, it was like $24 for one miniature. I know, I know. But I had looked at the miniature many times and said, no, that's too much for one miniature. You know, that's too much for one miniature. But every time I did that, uh, I always came back to the miniature, right? And then I read reviews, you know, and I, the, the, the praise for the miniature was just effluent. You know, just, oh, wow, beautiful, wonderful, exquisite. So this is what you will get in the pack for the night. And I think this is called the night or something like that. So it looks like we have a head here and another head here. One is with the helmet and one is without. We have a body. I don't know why this stuff wants to go out of camera, but we will work up here. So we have a body. Uh... We have an arm with the sword. We have arms with a hand holding the sword. Now this arm is holding it from a two-handed point of view, a two-handed clutch. Oh, wow, look at this. This is his cape. Look at those wonderful crosses on there. Yeah, that's what I love to see. Look at that detail. Look at that detail. A lot of people may not know that the Russians were actually one of the staunchest defenders of the church in its early years. Well, I guess maybe not its early years, but, you know, during the medieval ages. Uh, so we have here. I love this thing. I don't really even know what to do. 
I think this could be his base. This part. So you got a base here, or you can base him on this stylized base. Because I think I remember seeing somebody base him, putting him on this as a base. Look at that. I mean, look at that. Wow. Little Fleur de Lis. Here's his shield. I'm going to give you guys close-ups of all of this to make up for not having shown it to you earlier. So that appears to be a shield. If I can do that, get my hands out the way. With a lion. I assume that's a lion. It has some kind of... Almost looks like an angler's coming out of his side. Let's see if we can get closer. It doesn't like when I do that. So I don't know. It, it appears to be a lion's head. And I'm not sure if that is a sword it is grasping its mouth over or if there looks like an angel underneath there. If you can make it out. So that is interesting. Let's take a look at the body. Look at that armor. My goodness. Look at the mouth of the lion. Roaring. Look at the detail in this resin. And this is very similar to the Brother Vinny resin. It is uh it is resin, but it's not brittle. It's like a plastic. Look at that. Look at the detail on here. Wow. You know, and I normally prime my miniatures black just because it's a quicker form of painting. But this one I may do in a white. Prime him white. Matter of fact, I may do his whole armor and stuff as a white. So we have that. We have an arm piece. I think I'm going to go with the helmetless head. I always like helmetless heads because it, it adds character like you can you can kind of come up with a ideal of what the knight is like this one's face is somewhat uh submerged into his i guess that would be a, a scarf or cloak All right we looked at that let's look at the double-handed sword the double wielding two-handed wield or it appears like you can go with these, but I think you'd have to pick one or the other from the, the way the miniature is. I don't see how you could have him holding both swords. But there is a hand in there, and there's a hand in there. So they give you, I guess it's a sword option for one of his hands. Now this one looks like a left hand, although he has no left hand. Oh, wait, no, he does. He has this here. So you can either go with this, like that, or you can go with this, like that. All right, well, since it took me so long to show you guys this miniature and share it with you, I think I'm going to put it together and let you see what it looks like in all its glory. So I'll be right back. So welcome back everybody, sometime later, probably a couple of days later from when I first showed you this, but through the magic of video, we are able to do this and that is why I like to do these when I do my after painting show. So I'm just going to show you the progress I've made on the castle, uh, mostly I've just spent a lot of time trying to get some base paint coats down. Some of this may change because I was testing things out. So here I went with kind of a terracotta for the floor up there. I may go ahead and make that brown like the rest of this just so it doesn't break it up. I've used this kind of antique white here. And for a model this big, I mean I'm using 
you know, craft paints. I'm not using uh, my more expensive paints. So this is burnt umber, which is on the base there. If we move down the castle here, I did decide to kind of add one feature because I didn't know what to do with these kind of windows and these trellises. So I decided to board them up. I figured during wartime, this would be a very vulnerable spot. So that would get boarded up uh, in a certain way. And I'm going to probably put a wash over these to give them a wood effect. But I kind of like that. Uh, if we turn the castle around, uh, here, we can see the front entrance where I have the door or the gate. I have not, uh, I have not painted the stonework around there. I just painted the gate brown. If we come further up, you can see the brown, mostly all of this brown is going to get a dry brush. So basically it indicates woodwork. Uh, or it just basically indicates uh, dirt. So around the, uh, what is this, the breastworks or whatever of the castle, we will, we will make it look like woodwork. The floor we will make look like mud or dirt. Ah, uh, so most of the time it's taken me is kind of deciding what colors to put on here. Uh, I really didn't know what color to do, kind of the little keep right here in the middle. And then if you look at this, you can see a chapel here, right? So you have the buttresses going down here, sort of like Notre Dame's Cathedral. So I'm thinking of doing that in a white, just a pure white to just kind of show that that part of the keep houses the chapel. We kind of pull out and get a wider view of this. You can see how the castle is taking shape. I have, I have thought about doing some additional stuff around here maybe building that up to make it look like uh, rocks like the castle is perched on top of a rocky uh, rocky uh, fortress uh, which normally would be the case if they had one to perch it on so I may try to build that up I don't know the problem is if I use plaster or caulk I'm not sure if it's going to really stick to the base when I go to pick it up or whether it'll all just start dropping off. Uh, what might work is if I create like a textured type of glue and just build it up, but then that could look kind of wonky. So I'm not sure. I mean, I may, what I may wind up doing is just probably putting some sand and stuff on here and then dry brushing that uh, with maybe a stonework color. But so that is where we have made it to with the castle yet. So I will try to do one last update before I close this out. It just depends on when I want to get my video put up, whether I want to hold it for another day or two. Uh, but if nothing else, we will do an update and we will open this castle. Right? I don't know if that opens. But we will open the actual castle and show you uh what it looks like inside all right see you then okay i had to come back i'm not through assembling this but <laughs> this thing is such a beauty to put together i mean literally i have no glue on him other than his head which it fit in there without the glue i mean it was snug and what it is is there's a round kind of rounded uh ball and it goes right in there so i did pick the the helmetless version although i was tempted to go with the helmet he can hold double swords 
Or he can go with... Oh, this is such a hard choice. Or I can go with the two-handed sword. Which is a beautiful looking sword. As much as I like the double swords, I think that would be more appropriate for a cavalier or fighter or something like that. Since he's supposed to be a knight, I'm thinking I got to use the two-handed sword. All right, so this comes out. And I mean, this stuff is not glued, but it fits in there perfectly. And, you know, and I've done some of the other miniatures. I'm not going to criticize anybody, but they don't fit like that. I mean, they, they have these slots and nodules, but you always have to drill them or you always have to manipulate them or soak them in glue. This thing, look at that. Look at that. You guys just seen it. Look at that. Look how beauty I got to go with that one. And then he gets his cape. So we had this back here. This guy's going to be a paladin for sure. This guy's going to be a paladin. So let's see which way the cape goes on. Now the cape will need some glue. Because I can tell it's kind of, it wants to come off. But that's fine. That's fine. Look at it. Look at that. Now, he even had a shield, but if you use the shield, that's a separate hand option. So this guy, you could almost do probably 12 or 13 variations of this guy. You have the two heads, so that's two separate variations. You have an arm option, two arm options for the left hand, right? Because you can have it holding this or with its own sword. That's four. Two arm options for the right hand because you can have it holding this or a sword. So that's six. You can have him holding a shield in his right hand. Seven. You can have him with his cape on or without. Although you'd have to fill that in. Eight. Uh, so you get about eight separate options with this guy i mean look how he stands he can stand up without even being on a base oh my lord i want to order some more of these from this guy you guys have got to get in touch with this guy on his etsy channel and i i, I think i might this guy deserves a link i think i will put a link in here now i know what people were talking about when i read the reviews for this this miniature i will definitely order from him again but anyway, I am going to finish this up, guys. I don't think I'm going to show you guys anymore because this is pretty much the completed model. But, yeah, this is, this is 5 out of 5, 10 out of 10. All right, take care. I'm going uh, to let you guys go back up top later. And so this is the somewhat completed castle uh there are some other things i still want to do but for the sake of this episode because i guess the episode would extend two hours if i uh kept adding segments until i completed this i decided to show you guys my progress on it so if you want to see what it looked like before then obviously you can uh you can go back earlier in the video. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of painting. A lot of touch-ups. Actually, doing something like this in many ways is a lot more difficult when you're dealing with a big old toy than it is dealing with a smaller miniature. Uh, because every time I tried to get into a crack or crevice, I went over another area and then I had to redo it again. But uh, just to kind of show you some of the highlights. So the door here has this kind of wooden effect, dry brush. Uh, this I left uh, with a mud look. I may build that up later. But again, that was going to take too long. All of this has had like a wash, which is basically a craft teak wash. 
which is supposed to make it look like oak, which I think actually worked pretty good in most instances, especially, you know, these castles are older, meaning they won't, they, they aren't going to look new, you know, like they do on Disney. So, uh, I will probably add a black wash over the roof, uh, shingles and things, but, uh, I didn't have any and I'm going to have to mix some up. So that was something I didn't want to make you guys wait for. Uh, the hoarding is actually brown, uh, even though I did dry brush some of it. So let me see if I can turn this a little. So here you can see the castle. Uh, you can see the chapel there right here. This has all been put at the oak wash on it. The back part was cool where I added the wood here because I figured if the castle was under siege or attack, they would board these up. I mean, if I had more skill, I probably would have put some type of stained glass window effect in there. But uh, for the time being, I decided to board that up. You know as a defensive measure so and that uh, I'll give you guys another turn so there's like I said there's still some areas I've got to go touch up like there's a few areas here that need to wash because it's not as it's not as ruddy as the rest which will give you a good idea of I had to paint on that antique white and then you can see where it gets washed so that area I forgot to put some wash on it which I will get to uh, and like I said, there are a few more things I can do, but I think for the sake of this, I think it really gives you guys an impression of what you can do with basically is a toy, you know, that now looks actually like a model fortress. And that's why I put it on this, this, uh, role playing map. So you can see if your party approaches this castle or if you want to lay siege to the castle, you know, it's actually very, very nice scale. Now, there's one other thing we have to do that I uh, promised you guys I would do before we concluded this episode. And that's open this up. Okay, so this might be somewhat anticlimactic. But uh, you can see that it was a toy. You can see the little paper that was used for wallpapering. The inner chamber here. All of this I'm going to actually go in and paint too. But that's going to be a separate session. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to include that in the episode. Uh, I actually have little furniture and things that I can. I can place in here. That I've bought from companies like uh, Zealot Miniatures or Mantic Games. So a lot of that will get used. This will all probably be painted. Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking of a stone color. I think that would be appropriate. These rooms will be painted. I'm going to leave the paper just because it is it is medieval. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to show you guys the inside. It, it, it does have an inside. So you can obviously put miniatures here on the different levels or whatever if you decide to use it like that. So, yeah, like I said, maybe a little anticlimactic, but hey, you've got you to gotta go for maximum effect when you do camera work. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this episode. I think it's a little bit over an hour. Uh, I had some other content I was going to add, but I've decided I'm just going to do that as uh, some separate videos. So take care, everybody. God bless until I see you guys next time on After Painting.